Uh, hola a todos. Eh, es un placer invitar a presentar a Diego López Cámara, quien es catedrático con ACID en el Instituto de Astronomía en Ciudad de México, en la UNAM. Él es doctor en astrofísica e investigador del nivel 2 del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Estudió la maestría y el doctorado en el Instituto de Astronomía de la UNAM y posteriormente realizó estancias postdoctorales en el IA y en el Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares en la UNAM y en la Universidad Estatal de Carolina del Norte. Eh, el principal interés del doctor López Cámara es comprender eh, por medio de modelos analíticos y simulaciones numéricas la naturaleza de los fenómenos astrofísicos de altas energías, por ejemplo, destellos de rayos gamma, eh, largos y cortos, supernovas, fast radio burst, entre otros. Así como entender varias de las fases y pasos evolutivos que se presentan en los sistemas binarios estelares, por ejemplo, eh, la fase de envolvente común, del cual nos va a hablar ahora. Um, también eh, le encanta hacer divulgación, así que si algo no entienden, pues pregúntenle a los estudiantes que intentará contestar un ejemplo sencillo. Muchas gracias y adelante, Diego. Gracias, Jesús. Este... Y así, entonces, como dijo Jesús, soy cátedra con la CITE en el instituto. De hecho, soy el más viejo, lo cual, este, no sé, me hace sentir ya como senior de los catedráticos. Pero, bueno, entonces, gracias por la invitación. Eh, me decía Sundar, sé que Sundar habla español perfecto, pero no sé si está Ramandip, que no sé cómo, es, si está por ahí. Eh, en todo caso, eh, para... Para que todos entiendan, creo que me conviene hablar en inglés. Y si ya veo que este, no funciona bien, regreso a español o como sea, o le hago con un Spanglish. Entonces, bueno, voy a brincar al, al inglés. Eh, entonces, so this talk is titled Jets in Common Envelopes, eh, a low mass main sequence star and a red giant. And it's a work uh, I did with Fabio, de Cole a Ciencias Nucleares, Enrique Moreno, that's in the Facultad de Ciencias UNAM, Zagir Schiver, that's in Louisiana State University, and Roberto Giacconi, that was in Japan, and now uh, is trying to get tons of money out of academia. And so today is actually a rather good day for this paper study, because actually it was accepted just this morning. Uh, so, Yeah, so any feedback that I get cannot be inserted in this study, but maybe for future studies. Este, so yeah, it was good news today in the morning. So my talk, uh, I'm going to give like a brief introduction of what the hell common envelopes are that um, not many of us know. Well, even me, like a few years ago, I wasn't even involved in common envelopes and I didn't really understand it what it was, so I'll give a brief introduction. Then I'll give uh, three motivations of why we ended up doing this study. I call it motivation one and two, and then motivation three. And then I'll give you a quick insight of the study that we made and the main conclusions. So importantly is that um, the grand majority of massive stars are in binary systems. So here I'm presenting a is the histogram. This gives you the fraction of stars and here as a function of the, the mass. Do you see my mouse? I, I hope you do. Well, let me see if I can put laser. Yes. Laser. So uh, here are the single stars and we see that when it's like one solar mass, the majority of, of, of stars are single, and then like 30% are in binary systems, 10% are in triple systems. But if you go further to higher uh, masses, you see that the majority start being in binary systems, triple, or even more uh, systems. And so um, not only is it important so to have in mind massive stars tend to be in two or more uh, stellar systems. But also, uh, here all, one more is the fraction of the stars. And, but here is how many of these interact. And by interact, I'll 
focus on this later. But so we see that the these, these were the single stars, like only 20% uh, one, one, for one solar mass interact. And the further for binary systems, triple systems, more and more interact. And so specifically, uh, like, uh, este, we say that 50% of the systems uh, interact when the primary mass or the, one of the masses of the system is five solar masses or more. So you have a five solar mass or more. It's going to be for nearly for sure in a binary system. And there's a 50-50 that is going to be interacting. And so, ah, well, also like a brief uh, este, intro is the rush load. So for those who don't know what the rush load, so when you have a binary system that's uh, interacting, so the most massive star is gonna este, expand before it's gonna leave its zero H main sequence uh, before the other. And then there's this, a potential that is not, it's not, some people tend to get scared a bit when they see this potential, it's actually quite easy. So the first uh, term on the left is the gravitation potential of the, let's call it mass one of the massive system that here I'm, I'm plotting the potential uh, as a function of the distance. And it's only the, this distance here. So this is x. You know, it goes from the center of mass of each uh, of each star. This is going to be point L one, which is here. So this here is this here. And so the first term is just the uh, gravitation potential, gravitational potential of mass m one. This is here, and then the second term is the gravitational potential of mass M2. And then the important thing of, of the rush slope is, so this is the equi equipotential uh, curve, but there's, it's not only just the gravitation potential of M1 and M2, but here I actually put, it's really important, the system is rotating. So you have the angular velocity, and here is the extra, este, or the, the the fraction on in the potential due to the fact that it's twirling, no? And so when the massive mass star uh, starts expanding, so you, the, its potential is increasing, at some point it, it's completely full. And then if it keeps expanding, there's gonna be material that through L1, which is this point I was saying, begins falling in the potential uh, well of M2. And so there's mass transfer from the M1 that it filled its correspondent rush lobe. And then mass of this one is gonna fall into the, this, the M2. And so at some point, all of the mass is, all of this mass is gonna be in, occupying the whole uh, two lobes here. And, and when we have either that the material from here is also uh, covering all of this load, or if it's actually even somewhat bigger, we call this here thing, it's called the common envelope. Okay, so it's when the two stars have a common envelope. No, it's not, <laughs> we're not the best in naming this is the phenomena. Okay, so here, I mean, and, and so the difficult thing of common envelopes is that it's a really uh, fast uh, phase. So we haven't really observed a single system that it's for sure in the face of common envelope uh, through somewhat is the back of the envelope calculations. It seems that there's like an upper limit in a few thousand years. 
And so it's, it's, it's not easy if they observing binary systems in, in this phase. What we've been able to see, there are like three or four candidates that went through common envelope, not that too if long ago, but we haven't seen it like in the back main is the common envelope phase. And so here I'm, I'm putting a, a simulation from Allman. And so what I'm, what I'm put here, the plus sign is the center of mass of the primary, and then you don't see it, but here there's like a point mass of a, I think it was a white dwarf, and so it's going to be the X, and you'll see how it starts uh, interacting, and in the end, both of them are inside the envelope of the primary, and so it's in a common envelope. And so this is what we uh, know or through uh, numerical simulations. Um, so the, the important thing, not only because we have these beautiful videos, but the important thing is that through common envelopes are important because through common envelopes, the two stars may end up being really, really close. I, I don't see. They end up being, uh, or it seems that in some or these uh, candidates that I said that we think went through common envelope, it's because the two stars are way closer than what uh, our theory would predict if there hadn't been this common envelope phase. So thanks to the common envelope, the binary system can be really close, even in close contact. And for me, especially because I love high energy astrophysical phenomena, also common envelopes are important for high energy astrophysical phenomena. So let me just uh, give you like these three examples. One was done by uh, Enrico and William, and, and there's these other two. You'll see this, oh, the Abbott. So let me just uh, mention the main characteristics of each of these three cases. So in one, uh, there was this main sequence star, eight solar masses against one that was like 14.4. And in the end, this is the binary system ended up creating a, a neutron star, neutron star, which uh, merged and ended up uh, producing a short GRB. In, in the second case, it was a supergiant with a main sequence. And in the end, the supernova type 1A uh, was produced. And in the third one, this was the Nobel Prize. It was in which a very massive main sequence star 96 against another massive main sequence star of 60 solar masses ended up producing the first uh, black hole black hole uh, merger that LIGO recorded which was like 36 against 29 here it ended up being 30.8 and then you got the gravitational wave not the 1509 15 16 i don't remember what year it was and and so the important thing is in all of these uh, evolutionary paths, in all of them, the rush lobe is present and also the common envelope, which is my, uh, my main interest. Um, you can draw it whichever way you want, but there's that common envelope phase involved in, three, in these three. So you can produce short GRBs, supernovae, gravitational waves. And there's another, uh, I like this is the evolutionary path because it, it has two uh, main sequence stars. And in the end, I'm not gonna explain step by step, but the important part, part is you have a rush lobe, but then in this part, you actually, you can have a high mass X-ray binary and also a supernovae. And then there's a supernova, sorry. And then there's a common envelope phase involved and you end up with double the pulsars and then the gravitational waves and a black hole. And here only if you had, if the binary system had begun, had begun further separated with a bigger orbital separation, once more you have a common envelope, but here you have a supernova, and then a low mass X-ray extra binary. And then, but on the contrary, if it had been closer, 
uh, you have the, the contact binary, and then there you have gravitational waves, and in the end you have a magnetar. That magnetar is now maybe a soft gamma repeater, a short GRB, uh, maybe even long GRBs, or a fast radio burst. So, so the, the, the nice thing is that there's common envelopes in all of these phases. So that's why it's important. Yeah? So you can have close contact after the common envelope, and it can be important to create these really high energy uh, phenomena. OK, so that's the good news. The bad news, but actually good news for me. Uh, so the bad news is we really don't know yet which is the main uh, driving mechanism in the, in the common envelope phase. The first one was that it was orbital, uh, the closer the secondary is getting into the primary. I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see. Uh, so you're, a fraction of the orbital energy is dissipated, and this is the conservation of energy. So you had a lot of, not, energy here, and then you have less energy. So the rest, a fraction of that is, is the transmitted into the envelope of the, of the common envelope. And that makes the envelope, well, the common envelope evolve. And even in the end, you, they thought that it could actually end. It could un unbind the whole uh, envelope and thus no more envelope, no more common envelope. And that was the first uh, mechanism that was proposed by Van den Heuvel in 1976. Ah, and but it turns out this they call this this is the lambda uh, mechanism. The lambda mechanism isn't really able to terminate the common envelope phase, and then many other gamma prescription. It was the next one, which was not only orbital energy, but also angular momentum uh, was there. And so they thought that either angular momentum uh, was gonna be able to terminate. And then they thought, well, maybe the two of them, but it turns out not even that. And then there's ionization energy, nuclear energy, pulsations, dust, accretion, and now actually uh, magnetic fields. And so the bad slash good news is that none of these are really able to uh, terminate the common envelope phase. And so this left uh, este, like a beta de oro for us that interested that love jets. And so this left room for what about jets? And so I'm not claiming that Fabio, Enrique, and me were the first that proposed jets in common envelopes, actually, it was the Armitage. And now, recently, a lot of the non soccer that, that are studying or analytically uh, what happened when you have jets in common envelopes. But this is when we, when we got into this. Ah, so we can actually study this uh, with an analytic, este, este, an analytic approach and also with uh, numerical simulations. And so that's when we began uh, doing, so we like com compact objects, we like jets. And so we said, let's put a compact object with a jet inside a common envelope. And so we did two studies and mainly, so the first one we did uh, was putting a red giant and then we put a black hole and we launched, launched the most simple jets. Uh, constantly powered, uh, like, a, you know, you, you start like from the easiest and then you go complica complicating stuff. So this is our uh, spherical cow of our jets in, in, in a common envelope. But we, we got really nice results. And sorry, and let, let me just say, and actually, so this is what we are thinking of. But in the numerical simulations, what we do is we put the reference system in the compact object, you know? So the compact object is twirling around the envelope of the red giant, but now we, we put our uh, reference system there. And so we have like a wind, you know, because of the motion of the uh, secondary object, in this case, a compact object. So what we do is we put the reference system here and we have 
in, in numerically it's called we have a, a wind tunnel uh, approach and so we will see that there's a wind approaching the where the jets are uh, they're launched but this is you know consequence of the fact that the, com the compact object is, is the moving through the uh, common envelope and so actually we, for this so there's like this because I'm going to show some videos and so that you just understand. So there's like a wind. Well, there's this wind being injected from this boundary. We we only simulate the upper half of the of the problem. You know, uh, so there's a reflection boundary here. So it would be exactly the same on the bottom and. We launch these constantly powered jets, and we vary the angle, the time the jet is there, when when it was launched, how much it lasted, and also how how powerful the jet was at this this eta. And so, these are like the main results. If if this is like you don't worry of this about these numbers. It's just like this is a, a not non-powerful jet and this is a very powerful jet or very luminous jet and so wind would be coming here so there's a material this, this thing here this bulge is you know because there's the gravitational pull from the compact object so we have material that coming in here and back and so it's it's a uh, uh, being diverted into this place and since there's there would be the other uh, lower half. So the material that's coming here boop, cancels with the material that's coming here. Boop, and so the vertical uh, velocity cancels and you only have a uh, este velocity like in, in X, you know, in, in, in this. Este, um, orbit. Um, and so what we found is, yeah, that this was like, we knew that it was going to happen, that when the jets didn't have enough power, the material that's here, the wind material, but also there's material that's been you know, accreted here, uh, would choke the jet. And this is just pressure equilibrium. If the pressure of the jet is less than the pressure of the material that's falling onto it, so you're going to get choked. And on the other way, uh, if the Jet is really luminous, very powerful. So its pressure is going to be much more than that of the material that's falling. And you see, so we have this jet that goes through this bulge. Actually, we didn't know that the, that um, this was a nice thing that we saw. That so first the jet has to go through this bulge, which turns out more difficult than what we initially expected. Um, and the other thing that was rather nice is through. Este, once more, este, a back of the envelope approach for the pressure of the jet, the pressure that, that's been accreted locally, and the pressure of the material of the wind that's falling. We found out in this uh, plot, if you plot the pressure against the, the distance, so you can easily see there's like these, este, regions where we found that if the pressure of the jet was here it, it would be choked if it was here it, the, the jet would go out but the wind would uh, deform it but if the jet was really really powerful then it would break out of this bulge and it would go really vertical and the wind would do nothing to it so we knew like these three uh, possibilities and we actually found them numerically, as I'm showing here, when the jet was, was uh, este, choked, then when it was slightly deformed, you see this, this thing, and when it's really powerful, it's completely vertical. So this was a nice uh, result of the paper. But then we, we also uh, calculated how much material was being uh, accreted through this inner boundary. So this is, we, we, we we didn't go further in than this. Yeah? So we have what, whatever crosses this boundary, and this is a, is a assumption that the referee in this last paper didn't, or he, he was quite 
um, picky about. So what we suppose is all the material that crosses here in the end is going to create an accretion disk around the point source. Uh, and, and eventually it's going to be accreted or it's going to fall directly onto the point source. So it's going to be accreted. So what we suppose is all that process here is going to be accreted. Maybe, I know en Enrico has done some recent studies in which there's a fraction of the material that falls here that may go out and, and be, este, uh, that has a, energy well, and momentum enough so that it, it's actually unbound from this, but it's a really small fraction. So anyway, so what we did was we calculated how much mass crosses this inner boundary. And this is what we're showing here. And we see that once the jet is launched, that this is when the jet is launched, uh, the accretion rate actually falls a lot. And so, so like here, when, when the jet is launched, the accretion rate really falls. And that's due to the cocoon that is surrounding the jet. So here you have the jet, and then you have like that green yellow material that is the, the, the material that the jet is pushing outwards. And that material end up, ends up doing like a cocoon around the, the jet. So the cocoon is, is the, it's, it's produced by the jet, yeah? so the, it's, it's, it's not, in some studies, people put the, the cocoon by hand, but the cocoon creates itself, simply due to the fact that the jet is going through material, and then this material is, is being pushed aside, and then you generate this very nice, is the cocoon around it. And the cocoon has much lower density, like we can see here, and since it's really much lower density, that's why the accretion rate, boom, falls, and it falls uh, quite, I mean, at least an order of magnitude. Um, and so this uh, kills the, the most important uh, assumption that we did in this study that was jets are constantly powered. And so here we see that the accretion rate falls and the jets are created by a fraction of the mass that, that's crossing here, so the accretion rate falls, the jet power also should fall. And, and here we were always doing constantly powered jets. And so this was like, uh, okay, so we're seeing these interesting things, but then we see that this is not a very good approach for the powering of the jet. And so we went just directly. So, okay, so let's do a self-regulated jet that depends on the accretion and the amount of accretion rate that crosses that boundary. And let's suppose a fraction of that. And so we did the next study and the next we even went further and we didn't do only like a black hole, but we also did like a, a neutron star. And just to be consistent, we also made a control model of how it would look if it's constantly powered as in that previous study. So I'll just go first faster. And so, this is the once more like the type of uh, setup. It's very similar. Now, so we have a wind, there's a compact object and a jet and here. So just that, let me remind you the jet is uh, self-regulated or constant. By the way, these simulations that I've shown, I didn't mention it. So we're using uh, Fabio's uh, hydrodynamic. In this case, it's hydrodynamical uh, three-dimension uh, Eulerian a Eulerian code when it has AMR. And so all of this is done with mezcal. And so here once more, we saw that as expected, if the jet, no, if it's not very powerful, it's gonna be choked. If it's really, it's, I have this talk about it should be larger than, if it's larger than a certain efficiency, you get a powerful jet and it's successful. And when we say successful is that it manages to break out of this poach. But now, and so it's self-regulated. So it does depend on, on the, the cocoon with a lower accretion and then thus lower accretion rate crossing the inner boundary. And then this is the new so part. So the jet would have less uh, powering. And so we have a variable jet. No, it's, it, it launches, then it doesn't. It, it quenches, then it launches. And also we see that contrary to before, not only does it vary 
in, in its este, size, it also varies in, in, in the direct, its orientation. And so here I'm just showing like some este, uh, renders of how the jet is here. It's in this plane and then it's in this other plane. And so here we just see like how the material is falling. But so here it's in the y uh, x plane and here now it's in the it's the y z plane so it's completely changing its orientation apart from its size and orientation and as before we saw also when the jet is launched here the jet was launched further later we see as before so when the jet is launched you produce a cocoon and then uh, the cocoon makes the accretion rate diminish we call this, by the way, a negative jet feedback. Uh, so the presence of, well, there's this feedback of the cocoon. And then when, the, when there's no jet, there's no cocoon. And then once more, there's a high accretion rate, which powers once more the jet. And so we saw that uh, behavior. Um, but turns out, so the jet, the accretion rate does vary, right? does vary, but it doesn't vary that much. So we found that it varies by at most 50%. So taking a constantly powered jet isn't that terrible. It does, it's not a, a massive change if you take the constantly powered jet or if you uh, take this self-regulated jet, of course, the self-regulated jet has more physics in it, but uh, if you have taken the initial approach that we did, it's not that bad. It's only like a 50% error. Okay, so that was our personal uh, motivation, Fabio, Enrique, and mine. And then there was this study of Sagiv uh, Shiver at St. Luciana State University. Uh, and so he, he actually did this large scale study of a red giant and well, a main sequence star going through a red giant, which is what I'm putting here. They did consider, well, they considered constantly powered jets and we said, okay, it's not that terrible. And the only uh, complicated thing for Sagim, too bad, it's a really big uh, simulation. Thus, the amount of pixels that there is when, in the region where the jet is launched is not as fine as the ones we have. You know, we do smaller simulations with much better resolution, but we cannot do these very large uh, scales. And so what Sakiv saw is uh, he, he compared, uh, I, pardon, these kind of simulations, I, otra vez, when there's a jet and where there's not a jet launched. And so they compared when there's no jets launched, and once more, the, you see the, the X is the secondary, and you see the primary there. And then there's a case where no jets are launched, and the cases when jets are launched. And what they find and claim, which oh, I don't know if I had been the referee, if I would have let them do that. But anyway, so what they claim is that when there were jets, so this orange, so, there's this model with no jets, and then there's other model with no jets. And the only difference between them is the orbit, the initial orbit, orbital separation. And then for this initial orbital separation, they also put jets in, in a car, yeah, in a model which is very similar to this, but it has jets. And in the other, it has a the same for a bit wider initial orbital separation, no jets and jets. And so here what they plot is the fraction of unbound mass. And so what they find is that when there are jets, there's here's like twice the amount no, of unbound mass. And here is like also, but when you integrate, what they find is when there's jets, they actually, when there's jets, they are able to unbind three times more mass of the common envelope than when there's no jets. And this is when I saw this and said, oh my God, this is like a very uh, delicate claim to do. So is this really true? Like their resolution is not that good. Their jets are constantly powered. 
So um, I don't know. I, the, uh, let's find out. And so what we did is uh, we reached out for the Sagiv. And so what we ended up doing is we used Sagiv's uh, large scale uh, setup and we add our uh, small scale self-regulated good resolution jets. And so what we ended up doing is we compare for this setup main low mass is the main sequence star in this red giant with red, red ah, self-regulated jets or constantly powered jets or no jets. And especially this two, we then compare to Sagiv's to Shiret's uh, results. And so I, I sort of mentioned this, I should have put this before, I'm sorry. So there's two approaches there. So there's big, large scale, and there's the small scale. So the large scale, the, the pros is that you can see the global evolution. But as I said, the bad news is there's resolution problems, like the jets, if you want to have like very collimated jets, it's difficult. The accretion onto the secondary also is really difficult to, to, is to follow this formation also. And on the other hand, small scale simulations for all of these, it, it's good news. So we have good resolutions, the jet open angle can be solved. Also the accretion can be better followed, also the disk creation. But the, the bad news is that it's all local. So we cannot see this large global evolution. And so, yeah, it's one or the other. And so here, the overall morphology is not followed. Small timescales, well, here you can follow for many, many months or, or uh, years. Here we can follow for a few days. Uh, so, but what we did here, so is what I mentioned. So uh, we joined forces, uh, the large scale community was well, specifically Sagir Shir and Roberto Iaconi with Fabio, Enrique and myself. And so we ended up doing joining like this. Okay, let's use your large scale, large scale setup and zoom into a, the, the important part and let's use our good resolution, self-regulated or constantly powered jets and see what happens. Is the, the, do the jets really uh, impact as much as Sagiv claimed in his study. And so that's when this study comes here. Okay, I still have like 20 minutes. So I'm gonna go a bit slower now. Okay, so the setup that we are using is we use a Sagiv's large scale simulations. And so it's basically a one a solar mass with 80 uh, solar radii. And we put uh, in the border, like grazing. This is Noam Soccer called this. So it's grazing our main sequence star. Uh, and then also we're gonna, so we're gonna follow three three main moments. One is when it's about to plunge in, when it's grazing. And then also we follow one that's already uh, within the common envelope. And one is when it's like three quarters in, it's only like 25, well, 25% 25 of the size, it's at 0.76. And then when it's really in like at half of the, the size of the red giant. And you see there's, um, yeah, there's, and I say amazing, terrific. There's big differences if it's grazing, just plunged in, or well within plunge, it's plunging. And of course, in all of the cases, we're gonna launch the jets. And the jets, as I said, can be constantly powered or self regulated. Okay. Uh, and as also I mentioned, we use Mezcal. For this, uh, so we take into account Coriolis, centrifugal, uh, the local gravitational force of the point mass, also the point mass of the core of the red giant, which isn't in our simulations, but we do 
uh, take it into account in, in the, uh, the gravitational force. And in, so as I said, there's gonna be like three moments, grazing, plunging, and well within. In each of those phases, we're gonna follow uh, the evolution for 11 days. And yeah, these are the three moments. And not only 11 days, and we're also gonna see what happens when the jets are not very powerful and when the jets are utterly powerful, the jet efficiency. And so all in all, we did 30 uh, models. And so as you see, so it's grazing, it's when it's beginning and the plunging, and then when the plunge, it's well within the plunging, as you see, so there's cases in which no jets are launched when the jets are self-regulated or the jets are constantly powered. And here is the efficiency of each of the jets. And then I'm sort of hinting uh, the results. So here, X is when the jets are quenched and uh, palomita, este, well, I don't know how to say that in English. And so the check mark is when the jets are not quenched, not choked. Okay, so here I'm showing an example of when it's grazing. And this is an example of a successful uh, jets. And so you see, I no sé cómo parar esto. One sec. No quiero pen. Arrow. Arrow. Okay. So here's the initial uh, configuration. <sighs> So, I mean, just a technical thing. So it, it doesn't seem very nice, but this is due to the, the resolution that Sakiv gave us, but instantly, instantly our code is the suaviza, this thing. So we have quite good a resolution since the beginning. And then you see, so here's the, um, sorry, another thing. Here we did uh, simulate both halves. So I'm not reflecting the upper and the lower. So we are uh, resolving the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And there's slightly some uh, differences in the uh, jet velocity so that there, in the end, there's, we, we, we put like some seeds in the upper jet compared to the lower jet. So season the variability of the jet velocity so that they're not ident identical. So you'll see that there will be in the end some differences between the Northern uh, morphology and the Southern morphology. Okay, and so you're gonna see, so here's the main sequence star. And in this case, you don't see it, but it's actually going further in. In the other cases, you'll see how this, boom, does go really, it does modify its, its uh, initial value. But here, so we see how the jet is very successful and it's, it's the plunging. Enrique likes to call this the potato peeler. So we're, so the, this grazing thing is going through the envelope and it's psh, 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 ejecting the material that's just, you know, next to where the main sequence star and the jets are, are, are orbiting. And what else? And so for this case, we saw that actually the jets either constantly powered or, or self-regulated, actually they, it's, it's easy to have this successful non-choking jets. And so, uh, sorry, here I was showing when it's just, the efficiency is just 2%. And then we just went a bit further up 5%. And of course, is going to be also is this successful and higher, even more successful. And then what we saw is also for the self-regulated jets, we can also get uh, easily uh, successful jets. But for the self-regulated, we also got uh, some choke, some jets that were choked. And so all in all, it's like a it's not that difficult to get a jet that, well, um, 
to get for the jets to be able to be este, to not be quenched. And here uh, we saw that the jets actually need like something like 10 to the 37 hertz per second. And in the equatorial plane, we were also very interested in this study if uh, a disk was formed or not, because this, so what we really don't know yet of the common envelope is how much mass is accreted for the jet launching. So that was one of the interests. And the other is, is a disk created or not? And it depends on the group you talk to. Uh, Enrico is not a fan of the disks, but then Noam Soccer is a fan of the disks. So it depends on who you talk with. And so we intended to analyze is a disk here created and we didn't see any clear disk being created. And so this now is when it's further in, you see, it's when it's plunging in. So the jets are, uh, well, the main sequence star is, and here it's just a, so we're following it. So actually it's, it's twirling inside. Um, we also found that uh, jets uh, may be successful or well, the referee didn't like for us to say successful, that the jets are not choked, but we saw that the jets need more uh, powering. They need mass galleta for, for, uh, for them to be successful, no? So now we, we, we had more cases that for these efficiencies, the jets were quenched, choked, but we were still able to have uh, successful jets. So um, just, yeah, so here one, someone would say, hey, wait, but your, your efficiency is ridiculously, ridiculously high. So you need 50% of the mass that's been accreted to be realigned into the jets or the powering of the jets. So yeah, that's true, but, so here, another way of, being, of, of seeing this is this could go much lower. Right now we're doing uh, jets with 30 degrees, but if we do jets with half of that, this actually reduces by four times. So, so having high uh, efficiencies for the jet to be successful, you can also think it of, well, maybe just a very collimated jet with a powering of 10%. And in this case, so the jets need uh, two orders of magnitude more than in the bracing uh, case, but still no disks are created. So oh, this is getting interesting. And so when we went further in, this is when we half the way inside the red giant, we literally it didn't matter what uh, efficiency we used. No jets are, oh, the other way, all jets are choked. Each jet, like you see like uh, some jets here, are, like they're being launched, but after a while completely is the quenched. And so this was a really interesting thing because for this moment with the constantly powered jets, the large scale simulations said, we do see jets. And so, yeah, too bad for Sagiv's uh, study. It seems that their resolution was not, so we did also see some uh, resolution study and increasing twice or even more, uh, the jet is quenched, so choked. So yeah, uh, here's when poor Sagiv didn't really, uh, like a lot our results, but it is what it is. So um, yeah, seems that jets don't really play an important part when you're further in, which is here when Sagib was saying jets unbind three times more than when no jets are launched. And we are finding even if you're trying to launch a jet, it's choked. So, uh, yeah, what we were not able to do is calculate, so how much of the energy that the, 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 the jet, you know, like all this energy that stays here, if this energy would be able to unbind uh, the whole envelope and through simple uh, 
analytic uh, calculations, we saw that it doesn't really matter. And so, yeah, of course, what we will have to do is, because we are only simulating 10 days. And so that's the problem. We, we would need to simulate at least, we found like 10 times more, 100 days. And still 100 days would not be enough to give like a proper calculation of if the choking of the jets, the energy that's trapped there would impact on the termination of the common envelope. And so that is like a thing that still needs to be uh, further studied. And as I said, so what we still don't know is the mass accretion rate. And so what we here, what I'm showing is the mass accretion rate as a function of time for the three uh, moments. So this is when it's grazing, this is when it's at 0.76 of the red giant, and this is when it's half uh, the size of the red giant. And so, yeah, so since we're going deeper and deeper and in denser, uh, or the, the density is getting denser and denser, that's why the, den the accretion rate is getting higher and higher. Uh, um, the accretion rate, yeah, it's getting higher and higher. What we saw is it doesn't really matter. So in red, black, and blue, uh, we, we, blue is the constantly powered, red is the self-regulated, and black is even when there's no jets. And we see that the accretion rate is basically the same. And, and this actually, uh, what we're finding, if we compare the correspondent accretion rate with its bondi hoil with this wind, uh, accretion rate, we find that it's, it's like from 0.1 to 5%, which is actually consistent with calculations that we found before and also that uh, Noam, well, Soccer, and even Enrico and Macleo find in, in their studies. And also, yeah, even Sagif found, he found a bit higher, he found like 10%. But so we're finding this, and then, so the other thing that we were interested in is, is the disk created or not? And so there we, we, we also followed the angular momentum that crossed the inner boundary. And here, so sorry, in the left panel, it was one single uh, axis. So, no, so we're saying that it's getting higher and higher. In this one, it's the same value. So it always goes from like, 10 to the 18 to 2 times 10 to the 18, 10 to the 18, 2 times 10 to the 18, 10 to the 18, 2 times 10 to the 18, once more as a function of time. And here we actually see that contrary to the, the mass accretion rate that the further you go in, the higher the mass accretion rate, here we find that the angular momentum is basically the same. So it's around 10 to the 18. And this is, if, if you compare it to the critical angular momentum needed to form an accretion disk around a main sequence star, it's of the order of a third of the critical angular value. And so it doesn't seem that an accretion disk could be formed. Uh, and thus jets launched via accretion disks also wouldn't be able to be launched as we're doing, but then there's uh, other uh, possibilities to launch these jets. One is if the disk was pre-existent all the way before the main sequence star was uh, engulfed by the common envelope, you may have a pre-existent disk. And so that disk, if, if that disk survives all the way to half of the red giant uh, radius, then jets uh, would be able to be launched. And then there are other mechanisms este, that actually a very nice study came out one or two weeks ago. Eh, of, this is Robke's uh, group. And they actually find, as we do, so no accretion disk is formed, but they, are, they, they do common envelope simulations with magnetic fields. And they find that jets are launched via the magnetic towers. And so this may be a, a way in which jets may also be the, launched inside common envelopes.
Right, so with this I terminate. So I hope it's clear that uh, common envelopes are important. And so, and we're gonna see a lot of common envelope where it's gonna be more and more mentioned as Vera Rubin comes into operation. Uh, hopefully we'll find a system that is in a common envelope or there's gonna be much more uh, candidates of the common envelope phase just finished. And so, as I said, they're important because you get close contact binaries, high energy astrophysical phenomena is produced. And we are finding that jets may play a role. I'm not sure if it's the most important uh, driving mechanism, but at least the, the impact in the evolution of the common envelope. And as I explained, so we followed these jets in 3D hydro simulations of a main sequence star that's launching jets and it's going inside the red giant. And we see that depending on the on where it is, if it's grazing, if it's just within the envelope or if it's well within, the jets have different uh, outcome. Either they easily break out, they need very high uh, powering or they are completely choked. And so this is consistent with, no, so the mass accretion rate, uh, and we find that there is uh, not, doesn't seem that this will be formed, at least for a main sequence star. If the, it was a compact object, then it would be much easier to form an accretion disk around a compact object, but not in this case for a main sequence star. And then here's just like a, to illustrate the, the nice is the symbiosis that large scales with small scale simulations can be is the important in order to like study this uh, with more better yeah more realistic is the physics and so with that uh, thank you very much thank you a lot diego so uh, let us see some hands for questions. Uh, if that's okay, can we start with questions here in the auditorium? Yes, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, Diego. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, my first question is about this critical angular momentum, which you kind of answered a couple slides before. Uh, and so I just wanted to know, in, in your simulation, you weren't able to reach the critical angular momentum. So you know from your work on GRBs, we need critical angular momentum to be able to launch jets, as you mentioned. Uh, so how is it an impossibility uh, in such a scenario that you simulated that you will never be able to reach uh, critical angular momentum? I mean, people have people done analytic studies to, to see that? Yeah. First of all, nice to see you, Ramandip, and great to have you in Mexico. So uh, then, yeah, so what we're finding is that for the main sequence star, the critical angular momentum like in, in the radius of the main sequence star, it's not enough. As I said, when the studies that we did using uh, compact objects, then there we do see that an accretion disk is formed. So that's, that's the, yeah. So with the compact objects, you would be able to create the accretion, or accretion disk would manage to be created. But for the main sequence star, it doesn't seem like it. Okay, my second question uh, is when when you move your uh, main sequence star inward when it plunges inside, uh, and you show the simulation. Uh, one thing I've noticed that there is no, uh, you know, again going back to uh, your views, you always see collimation happening of your of your jet. Here, I kind of didn't didn't see that. Uh, and the second part of the question is, what is the binding energy of the star, and how much energy are you actually injecting? Uh, to unbind the star. Yeah, so in, in the grazing stage, the I mean, the collimation in GRBs is done because it's going through the collapsor, which is really dense. And here the density is, is not enough for, or the, the medium density is not enough to collimate. The jet still, I don't know if you, uh, let, me, let me stop this. Still you do, uh, we do see some collimation shocks. So like, I don't know, back there so it, it is in a way somewhat collimated just not 
as much as for relativistic jets in, in GRPs. And so, so but the next, sorry, but the next one, when you show the, uh, the object is completely inside the star. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? One, two, yeah, there. Yeah. There is no collimation happening here, right? Yeah, there's no jet. There's, there's no, no jet, they're, they're completely okay. choked. Stuff is still coming out, but then it's getting choked. That's the yeah. idea. But I, 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 was, I was trying to see if, if, because you put in a lot of energy and pressure into the, like a cocoon is formed, and it's, it is supposed to collimate the, the jet itself, which I don't see happening here. Yeah, so the, the cocoon and the jet are really close. And so the cocoon and the jet are completely choked. Okay. But then, and, and the other thing that you asked of the, how much of the binding energy. Yeah. I don't want to lie. I don't remember. But, but the, the, jet, the, the jets are far from the binding energy of the, of the, of the star, of the red giant's binding energy. Is that, the thing I remember is like two orders at least below. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Do we have another question here? The auditorium. Okay, can I ask a question? Uh, so how realistic is to start this simulation when you have the uh, companion start like half or one, uh, something like that inside the start without yeah. to the inflation of the Red giant star, for example. We know that these have the very extended uh, atmospheres, or I don't know, mass losing. They, they are mass losing stars. Yeah. So I, I seem to think that you're you are suggesting that they, there will be no jets in this. Yeah. So I mean, now now that the paper is accepted, <laughs> I can talk of its uh, delicate uh, assumptions. And one is the one you're saying. This is yeah. So we are taking snapshots and we are putting the jets to, to be launched either in this moment or in this not halfway. So the way we were thinking of it is that, <sighs> that it, 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 so when the, you know, so the material has been accreted, the accretion disk has been created, and then you, know, you have the diffusion time for the jet to be launched. So what we were saying is, okay, so in this case, or, or say in this case, the diffusion time is exactly uh, the 150 days that have already gone by. And um, so, so what we're, the way we were able to sort of uh, justify this is if the diffusion time is really fast, so we have the grazing, grazing the jets are launched since the beginning. And then if you have a somewhat, it's the larger diffusion time, so it's launched in the mid case and if the diffusion time is really slow, then we would, the jets would be launched when it's well within. Saying that, so uh, yeah, so the problem is, of course, what we wanna have is large scale with, you know, so like having the whole evolution with a magnificent, super fine resolution in the jet launching. And so oh, that unfortunately is still uh, far from our reach, at least yeah, with the supercomputers that we have at UNAM. And so, and this was, yeah. So, ah, no sé qué decir. So yeah, it has, it has problems. Then also another thing that I, I don't like is, and so having the, the, as you said, having the object launched right in, in when it's, it's the, it grazing. So as it's coming further and further in, this would have like a droplet uh, morphology. And so the morphology of the envelope you know, will also the modify. I don't know if the expanding in, 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 so you were saying the, the expansion of the envelope, right? Yeah, something like that. That would be in a, stars, in a get main sequence, two couple of main sequence stars and one stars evolving first and then inflates its up uh, later. Yeah, but the inflation is in the Kevin Helmholtz time, no? So it would be much, much slower than a few days. So I'm not very worried for the inflation of the star. What I am worried is for the 
gravitational pull of when the say if 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 we started with a larger orbital separation, so the material here would it wouldn't be this beautiful uh, sphere; it would be deformed. So yeah. that's another thing that I would like to also do, to like see, like uh, yeah, thanks. But that's now that the paper is accepted. No, I wouldn't say this before. Uh, do we have another question here at the auditorium? Uh, Quickly one. Yes. Uh, is there any observational motivation to, to do this? I mean, do we have any hints that, hey, we need jets uh, from, from this kind of system to explain an observation? Not yet. So we're trying to beat the observations to have as many theoretical, analytic, numerical studies. So when Vera Rubin is, is going, uh, that we have something to compare against. Could you mean by in low mass systems? systems? Yes, we do, we do have some cases, at, at least five that are, have been confirmed that to have evolved through the common envelope evolution, mm -hmm. and they have very fast jets, like more than 100 kilometers per second. Okay. But in general, in planetary nebula, for example, we see jets um, that we still don't know how to explain without this kind of like evolution. Mm -hmm. So you meant you have jets in those systems, so how? They were able to achieve critical angular momentum and were able to launch. I, I don't know about the system in, in, in the center of the nebula. I just okay. we just know that these are jets and they're very fast expanding. Okay. More than 100, 200 kilometers per second. And for that, okay, so let me just I mean it's not even my study, but I don't know if you've seen this one. That is this one is actually where you're talking planetary nebula uh, configuration, and they launched these uh, main sequence star against like a, this is more an AGB. And this is face on and this is edge on. And they end up launching like these fast jets, you know. So they observations observe like these low velocities here, like less than a hundred kilometers per second. And then there's these high velocities that have been observed, like this was saying, like even more than a hundred-ish kilometers per second. And the, this is Rockes group and this the and it's beautiful. I, I recommend really like look at this and they actually compare with no magnetic fields and with magnetic fields and what they see is, so the magnetic field is not the most important, like it actually doesn't modify the orbital separation, it doesn't modify the big morphology, but you do need some magnetic field to create, to launch those jets. And this is very nice. So I recommend this study. It's not mine, but I, it, I, it just gets me excited like looking at these nice results. Yeah, and also these cases where we see that these very fast jets, the orbital separations are very close, they're very compact. So mm -hmm. that's the common envelope scenario. It seems to be the best right. to explain the morphologies, the jet velocity, and the orbital separations. So we don't have any questions in the auditorium. Okay, thank you, Jesus and Ramadi, for the discussion. Uh, do we have any questions in the um, among the Zoom audience? Let's see some hands. while we wait to see if we have any questions. I have a stupid question. The very first movie that you showed, uh, you were talking about, um, okay, I'll wait till you scroll. No, the, the very first one. Uh, huh. Mine or just like in? Uh, yeah, maybe. No, even before this, I think. Uh, this is the first simulation. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Uh, there was one where you, uh, where you started talking about how the jet develops uh, exactly symmetrically uh, vertical, and there was a companion as well. So you had a comparison uh, where uh, if the power is not enough, then uh, the jet is choked and the companion ah, okay. gets all the mass okay. transfer. You mean? Yeah, yes, that one. Yes. So my, my you on this movie, please. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned here that um, when there is a successful jet, then the, the jet becomes perpendicular to the um, X, Z plane. Yeah, but, uh, like I can see that it eventually points away from the component. Yeah, Yeah, that was another of a nice finding. So we were expecting for the wind to push it backwards, but it turns out the bulge has also pressure and the bulge is pushing forward the jet. So you have like the bulge pushing forward and here the wind pushing backward. 
And so what we found then we have like jets that are bent. And so this part is pushing this way and, and the wind that's coming here is pushing the other way. So we have like this. And so, so my question was going to be, uh, is this a detectable thing? Uh, is it completely, uh, so is it bent and then eventually uh, writes itself or is it always going to be at that angle? And is it measurable uh, physically? Uh, so this was the, the most uh, spherical cow study. So what I would prefer like using this one and here what we see is the jets completely, yes, you know, vary. And the Perfect. other thing is this is all super within the common envelope. Like That's common what, yeah. envelope is still like 10 times more this, this size. So we would need to okay. be much bigger to see uh, the global event. But if you see like, so you see here it's being pushed forward here, but it's being pushed backwards there. Uh -huh. So this would kind of be wiped out uh, at larger scales. Yeah, I don't know. I think that in the end, the wind uh, or the orbital motion of the secondary is going to be the one that's been pushing like the wind backwards. Okay. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions in the Zoom audience? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Diego again for an excellent talk. Thank you for the invitation. And it's always nice to see you. Okay, oh, well, um, everyone uh, have a good afternoon and we'll see you again uh, two weeks from now. Thank you, Bye. Ciao. See ya.